afraid Cause we're not alone God is on our side Who can be against us God is on our side We won't be afraid Though the mountains may fall And the sky will crumble There ain't nothing gonna stand in our way If God is on our side Who can be against us Though the mountains may fall and the sky will crumble, there ain't nothing gonna stand in our way. Us. God is on our side, we won't be afraid. Though the mountains may fall and the sky will crumble, there ain't nothing gonna stand in our way. God is on our side, who can be against us? God is on our side, we won't be afraid. Though the mountains Fall, and the sky will crumble There ain't nothing gonna stand in our way You may be seated well, good. Good. Uh -oh. Hang on. No, it's on, it's me You know, your mouth moves and nothing comes out That's why you couldn't hear me How are y'all doing? Good. Yeah, that's a good start, right? Thanks, y'all, for leading so well. Hey, my name is Greg. If, you don't, if we don't know each other, it's great to see you this morning. If we do know each other, it's great to see you, too. Um, grab your bulletin. I don't know. You know, there are some wonderful youth that stand at our door every week, right? Thank them for serving. That's great. And uh, they, they hand us these bulletins every week. We walk in the door. And I don't know about y'all. Sometimes I, I give it a quick glimpse, and then it ends up in a Bible. Y'all know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. So grab this real quick. We're going to make it a useful tool this morning because I want to draw attention to some things. In the meantime, while you're pulling it out, we're glad you're here. If you're a guest this morning and we don't know each other or you have questions about Anchor or you'd like to get connected at Anchor, we'd love to hear from you this morning. There are connection cards in the uh, commons area out right out here, and we'd love for you to just jot that down and you can put it in the offering box or you can put it back there or hand it to somebody and we'll get it to someone and make, make sure we answer any questions or get you connected into the body here at Anchor. I want to draw your attention to um, something that's right there on the inside at the bottom under Matt's signature um, about an upcoming, uh, I don't know what you, it's a happening, happening this, uh, it's not this Saturday, it's two Saturdays from now. It's the Churchwide Spring Clean and, clean and Refresh Day. Now, how many of y'all need a spring clean and refresh day at your house? Yeah. Right, yeah. <laughs> I hate to disappoint, we're coming here to do one here, okay? So, and then you can recruit people to come over to the house when we're done, and you can, you can do one at the house as well. But we need to do one around here as well, all right? So we've got some cleanup projects to work on, and Karen Palomar shaking her head because she's the one that's coordinating. Her name is in that paragraph and her phone number. And so we're doing most of our communication through our, through our small groups, but if you are not in a small group or you just want to raise your hand and say, I'm in, maybe you've got some special tools, resources, a truck, Anything heavy lifting, whatever that Karen may say we need, just go to Karen. Raise your hand, Karen. She's right there. Two hands. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> and, uh, and she will help you get connected to that spring clean. Otherwise, um, just want to remind you of some of our uh, groups that are meeting, our small groups, our uh, discipleship classes. We have the class in here at 9 o'clock. The Discover class is going right now. Um, all kinds of way to get, ways to get connected. Prayer time on Wednesdays and Sunday mornings. And so just want to encourage you to find ways to plug in to Anchor Life. It is so good to be together. Amen? Yeah? I hope you all had a great week. Um, we're going to start a great week together. All right? So why don't you stand with me and um, let's pray. If you're with us online this morning, we're glad you're here. 
Uh, thank you to all who are serving and have served today to, to bring de- today together. And uh, let's, let's pray uh, together. Father, thank you for um, the privilege of, of being together today. We're reminded that your scripture tells us that you are present with us here today. So, Father, as, as King of kings and Lord of lords, Father, we come to, um, to see you um, high and lifted up, to, to praise you and to recognize you as, as the great I am, the one who is and is to come. Father, we are so grateful that as your children we have your promises, that, that you promise uh, to seal us um, until the day of redemption, Father, that you never leave or forsake us, Father, that your truth of your word is as sure and complete today as it ever has been. And Father, that uh, as your word is proclaimed in this place today, as you speak through Matt, uh, Father, would you give him uh, your words? Um, Father, would we hear it? Would we apply it? Would we live it? Um, Father, would we not only uh, glorify you in our lives, uh, Father, but may others come to know you, um, not just because of our lives, Father, because you have called us to share the truth of the gospel. So, Father, um, would you uh, be glorified in all that we do today, Father, as the, the worship team leads, Father, would these words um, not just uh, be words from our mouths, but they f- be from our hearts. And, Father, we love you, and we come to praise you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's continue singing as Walter leads us.
passion, love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of the Savior. Scripture reader Teresa is coming up. Today our teaching is from Nehemiah chapter 4. When Sam Ballot heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews, and in the presence of his associates in the army of Samaria, he said, what are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble, burned as they are? Tobiah the Ammonite, who was at his side, said, what they are building, even a fox climbing up on it, will break down their wall of stones. Hear us, our God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over as plunder in a land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight, for they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. So we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height, 
for the people worked with all their heart. But when Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the people of Ashdod heard that the repairs to Jerusalem's walls were gone ahead and that the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. They plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. But we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, the strength of the laborers is giving out, and there is so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. Also, our enemy said, before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them and will kill them and put an end to the work. Then the Jews who lived near them came and told us ten times over, wherever you turn, they will attack us. Therefore, I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at the exposed places, posting them by families with their swords, spears, and bows. After I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, who is great and awesome, and fight for your families, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your homes. When our enemies heard that we were aware of their plot and that God had frustrated it, we all returned to the wall, each to our own work. From that day on, half of my men did the work, while the other half were equipped with spears, shields, bows, and armor. The officers posted themselves behind all the people of Judah who were building the wall. Those who carried materials did their work with one hand and held a weapon in the other, and each of the builders wore his sword at his side as he worked. But the man who sounded the trumpet stayed with me. Then I said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, the work is extensive and spread out, and we are widely separated from each other along the wall. Wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet, join us there. Our God will fight for us. So we continued the work with half the men holding spears from the first light of dawn till the stars came out. At that time, I also said to the people, have every man and his helper stay inside Jerusalem at night so they can serve us as guards by night and as workers by day. Neither I, nor my brother, nor my men, nor the guards with me took off our clothes. Each had his weapon, even when he went for water. Nehemiah chapter 4, the word of our Lord. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we're grateful this morning uh, that we serve and worship a warring, conquering Savior uh, who is enthroned, who rules and reigns in the universe. And Lord, that you called us to be a part of your work. You are building your kingdom, and uh, you've called us to serve with you, alongside of you, and participate in your work. And we, uh, Lord, we just praise you for that this morning. Lord, we're thankful for your word. Lord, we're thankful that you continue to speak to us, and we ask this morning, God, that your word would be living and active to us uh, as, as it's proclaimed, Father. We pray that we would hear well, but we would not be hearers only, Lord, but we'd be doers of your word, and uh, Lord, would you, would you bring your word to us in power and uh, help us apply it to our lives, Father, that you could be glorified and Lord, we just lift this time up to you. I lift up Matt this morning, and uh, Lord, thank you for his faithfulness and preparation. And Father, we just pray that you give him great freedom and boldness this morning and clarity, and um, that we would just hear from you and that we would see you for who you are. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Uh, if you have a copy of God's Word, um, I want to encourage you to follow along in Nehemiah chapter 4. Uh, this is one of my, I think I like, love this book, but this is one of my favorite chapters. Very excited to be in it today. Today is our sixth message in a series through the book of Nehemiah that we're calling Rebuild, the story of Nehemiah. So um, just to kind of catch us up, 
Um, Nehemiah is a character in the Old Testament who God called to rebuild the wall around Jerusalem so that the worship of God might be reestablished in the city of God. So in studying this story, we're seeking to learn more about how we as God's New Testament church might be used of the Lord, used of God to build his kingdom so that the worship of God might spread to all peoples of the earth. So just to kind of give us a little bit of a sense of where we've been. And I, I like to do this in a story like this, in a book like this. Sometimes you're like, well, we've, we've had a review every week, but I think it's important. In chapter 1, Nehemiah received the news that the people of God and the city of God were in great trouble and shame. And the response was, Nehemiah wept and mourned for days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. He was brokenhearted, and the text says he prayed day and night and day and night and day and night while he waited for God to open the door for him to help. So from this, we called the church to be brokenhearted. There's actually a slide up there, Christian. I don't know if you see it. A little bit of some review slides. We called the church to be brokenhearted over the lostness of the world and the inaction of the church. Then, in the first part of chapter 2, we saw God working in Nehemiah through consistent prayer and fasting to focus him on his mission, to prepare him to speak up, to lead him to greater dependence upon the Lord, to embolden him to take some risks, to provide wisdom, to navigate complexity of these situations, to give him a vision for his work and to strengthen him for the task. From this, we call the church to embrace humble dependence upon God through fasting and prayer. So we call the church to be brokenhearted over lostness in the world and the inaction of the church, And we call the church to embrace humble dependence upon God through fasting and prayer. And then in the second half of chapter 2, Nehemiah goes to Jerusalem to assess the wall and the workers and also to share God's calling and mission with the people. Near the end of chapter 2, because God has clearly put his hand on Nehemiah, the people respond to Nehemiah saying, Let us rise up and build. So a few weeks ago, we called the church to rise up and to take ownership for the work of building God's kingdom and God's church, to be people wholeheartedly committed to the work of making disciples, wholeheartedly. Then in chapter 3, last week, we discovered an accounting of all who worked on the wall. All of God's people joined, except for a group of people We talked about these guys, the Tekoite nobles, who in verse 5 of chapter 3 refused to stoop and serve the Lord. So priests, temple servants, rulers, regular folks like goldsmiths and perfume makers, sons and daughters, people from near and far, they all came together to build the wall. And from this, we called a diverse church, a congregation of people that God has called together in this place to stand together in the work of building God's kingdom and church to join together and stand together in the work of making disciples. So coming out of all of this, these first weeks, these are foundational and critical for this book. And ultimately, I think, for understanding the posture by which we approach the mission of God. So from this, the last few weeks, we call the church to choose before the Lord to rise up and build or to maintain a posture that says, I will not stoop to serve the Lord. And we made it clear over the last couple of weeks that for God's people, there's only one clear choice. To humble our hearts within the context of God's church where he's called us and to wholeheartedly embrace, to rise up and to wholeheartedly embrace God's calling to make disciples of all nations. To invest our lives fully and wholeheartedly in the work of building God's kingdom and God's church. So Anchor family, this is an important question for us as a faith family. In a lot of ways, it's, it's a bit of a line in the sand for us. And it's important, I think, in large part because of what we're going to see and what we're going to discover in chapter 4. There's an enemy that comes to oppose the people and the work of the Lord. There's an enemy And the truth of the matter is, those who sit on the sidelines, if you go all the way through the New Testament and you um, explore the teachings of the New Testament, what we find 
is that those who sit on the sidelines, those who are casual in their approach to Jesus, they do not endure to the end. And so what we're going to see this morning is a very real enemy coming, a very real enemy attacking even. A very real enemy that is unfolding a very particular and very thought-out plan with the people of God, seeking to disrupt and disillusion the people of God in the work that God has called them to do. And so, the truth is, only those who say yes to the Lord in repentance, turn to Christ and begin to humbly follow Him, those who are empowered by God to live the way, truth, and life of Jesus, they'll be the one who withstand the attack and endure to the end. They will be the ones. So lean in here with me. I'm going to say a couple of strong things here at the beginning before we begin to unpack the text. The Christian life that we've invented, that we've been sold, that we've embraced is a mere shadow of what God intends for the Christian life to be. We do not turn We do not turn away from our sin and the way of the world to slip into a robe and fuzzy slippers, to sit back and enjoy the warmth of Christian community and feel weekly warm good sermons and worship songs. We turn from our sin to follow a king who is actively executing a battle plan to bring redemption to every nation, every tribe, and every tongue. To see the worship of God spread among all peoples of the earth. Jesus laid down his life on a bloody cross and rose from the dead to empower a people for this purpose. Jesus has called us up. Think more of it like this. He has drafted us. He has drafted us. And it's time to put on the full armor of God. It's time to get serious about our calling to make disciples of all peoples. It is the purpose of the church. The more we embrace the mindset, this mindset and God's mission, the more, in, more of a threat will become to, to, to the enemies of God. And the more of a threat we become, the more we need to be ready and alert. Why? Because there is a very real enemy who is going to more and more directly oppose God's people and God's mission as we step into the work that God has given us. The truth is, he owns the church in fuzzy slippers and a bathrobe. He owns that church. No need to worry about a church that sits in the comfort of cultural Christianity. No need to worry about a church like that. But a church filled with the Spirit of God A church filled with the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, one that is stepping into the work of Jesus, the one who is following Christ, that church is a grave threat. A threat that Scripture teaches us in the New Testament that the gates of hell cannot overcome. So here's our big idea for this morning. I want to encourage you to write this down. Be alert. Be alert, because saying yes to God's mission invites opposition from an angry enemy. Church, be alert, because saying yes to God's mission invites opposition from an angry enemy. Now, today, this is kind of my off to the side, not caveat, but just there's people in the room, when we open up a sermon and a teaching time in Scripture, that draws from warring text, and we're seeking to turn the church's mindset, what we're not talking about is culture war. That's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is brokenness, loss, and lostness in the world that a very real enemy, Satan, desires to maintain. And that God has redeemed us with a message of God's love, mercy, and grace to declare. And so the war we're speaking of is a spiritual war. It's not a war against people. It's a war against the enemy of God. 
a war to see people's perspectives change, for them to repent, for them to embrace Christ, for them to be redeemed and forgiven, for them to gain new life. Like, it's God's calling on our lives to be the hands and feet of Jesus, to bring the salvation and mercy and grace and goodness of God into the world, to bring about the worship of God among all people. So if you're in the room and you're thinking, man, this is intense, there's warring language, understand that there's a very real enemy that wants to keep you exactly where you are. And the war we as a faith family want to enter is the one that is for your good, the one that that knows that the only source of true good is the salvation of God. We want a war for your redemption, your heart, your forgiveness, and your good, because God's good. Verse 1 shows this big idea very clearly in chapter 4. Coming right on the heels of Nehemiah's accounting of God's people who rose up to rebuild the wall, Nehemiah 4.1 says, When Sambal had heard that we were rebuilding a wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. Now, he's not like a little irritated. Sanballat has decided that he is peeved over the fact that God's people are rebuilding this wall. But it, I don't know if you noticed, but it wasn't just Sanballat. Verse 2, he says, uh, verse 2 says that he was in the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria. So catch this. You got these people, un untrained common people who have either lived in exile or who have been incredibly poor in the community, who have taken up the trowel and the shovel and this and that, and they're doing concrete and construction work. And over on the hillside, you've got Sam Ballot and the Samaritan army. So contrast those two groups in your mind for just a second. And not just them, but Tobiah the Ammonite was by his side, the text says. So the people of God, under the direction and power of God, the weak and set aside and bruised and broken people of God, God has raised them up. Under the hand of God and by the power of God, they've joined together to rebuild. And the enemies of God have caught word of it, and the army, and a trained army of warriors has come, under the leader of Sam Ballot and Tobiah, to oppose the people and work of the Lord. Now, from an earthly perspective, the people of God are done. They're done. But God knows better. God knows better. How in the world do these people, weak as they are, oppose the work of the Lord? I mean, um, how, um, how, do they oppose the, how do the enemies of God oppose the work of the Lord? So verses th 1 through 3 tell us, first, that they mocked God's people and their work. They spread lies meant to divide and demoralize those who rose up to build. And over the next few weeks in the text, we'll see the enemy, even, even within this text, shifting tactics and becoming more and more indignant and dangerous. But initially, the work of the enemy was that they criticized and ridiculed God's people in the work of the Lord. That was the first step. So the question comes, how do you deal with that? How do you deal with that? When we say yes to the Lord and have wholeheartedly embraced the work of building the kingdom and the church, and when the enemy of God, Satan, comes in some way to ridicule and so lies, how, what do we do? So this, this ridicule, we, we recognize the enemy as Satan. But oftentimes this ridicule comes in a lot of different forms. It can come from outsiders, people who clearly do not know and love God, who want to see God's like people fail. Again, remember, God calls us to love our enemies and pray for those who despitefully use us, but this opposition can come from the outside. It can come from within, from maybe to co-white nobles who, only re who, who not only refuse to stoop and serve the Lord, but become an active opposer in the work and will of God. We'll see later in the text that there's people from surrounding communities that are Jewish people that come. They've chosen not to embrace, and they join the enemies of God in seeking to demoralize the people out of care and compassion. They're like, hey, you're going to be in big trouble if you keep doing this. They're going to kill you. And so these sort of messages, they, they can come from Satan himself. We, thoughts pop into our heads, feelings in our hearts, circumstances surrounding us, put us in this position to think, yeah, this can't be done. Sometimes people from the outside go, you're 
your work is foolish. Sometimes people from the inside go, you know what, you're going to get, get, get messed up in this. Your family's going to get messed up. Your life's going to get messed up if you step into this. So how do we deal with this? I'm reminded at this point of 1 Peter 5, 8, and 9, where it says, be alert and of a sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world, notice that this is a normal reality for the church, according to God's word, that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings and difficulties. So how do we resist? How do we stand firm? How do we fight back? Like, that's our question for today. So I want to invite you to write this down. It's truth number one. When the enemy prowls, that's going to be our language for today. When the enemy prowls, reject his lies. When the enemy prowls, reject his lies. So verses 1 through 3 um, say this. Now when Samballot heard that they were building the wall, he was angry and greatly enraged, and he jeered at the Jews. Verse 2, and he said in the presence of his brothers and of the army of Samaria, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore it for themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they finish up in a day? Will they revive stones out of the heaps of rubbish and burned ones at that? Tobiah the Ammonites beside him. And he said, yes, what they are building, if a fox goes up on it, he will break it down, break down their stone wall. So there's all of these, these lies. In verse 2, Sam Ballot says, in essence, to the army, they are weak. Look at them. Ha! They're weak. They're powerless. They're not going to get this down. They're, they're powerless. They're not going to reestablish worship. They will never finish that. This city and its burned and broken down walls is not redeemable. It's not redeemable. Then in verse 3, Tobiah basically says, that wall that they build, even if they build it, it's not going to last. If a fox walks on it, the wall's going to fall down. The enemy sows similar lies in our hearts as a family, as an anchor church family. He says, you're too weak. You don't possess the power of God. You don't possess it. Your mission to spread the worship of God, that's going to fall flat. It's going to be disappointing. The work you've taken on, it's too big. It's too big a vision. It's too big of a mission. The world is too broken for you to make any difference. Your progress, this stuff you're celebrating around every corner, it's negligible. It's nothing. What you build, it's not going to last. It's better to return to the fuzzy slippers and robe because your kids and your family and your job and your hobbies and your 401k might suffer. There's very real eyes that the enemy sows in our hearts when God calls us to step in and step up in the work of unfolding his kingdom. Friends, when the lies come, reject them in favor of God's promises. Can can I say that again? Reject them in favor of God's promises. Who will you believe? Who will we believe? Scour scripture to discover and even memorize verses of promise. Because friends, hear me. We're going to need those verses of promise when the enemy comes. Promises like, I will never leave you or forsake you. Now hide that one in your heart. Jesus, even in the Great Commission, says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go make disciples. And at the end, he says, and I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. 
the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. You remember that conversation between Jesus and Peter, and he's like, upon this rock I will build my church. And some people get a little confused, and they think that he's actually talking about Peter and a whole system of leadership is set up. But what he's really talking about is the confession that Peter's made. You're the Christ! My life is informed by the truth that you're the Christ! And Peter, Jesus says to Peter, now upon that I'm going to build my church. A church filled with the declaration, you are the Christ! In Scripture, Jesus says to, to Peter, the gates of hell will not prevail against a church that holds to the truth that that is my Christ. That is the Christ. That is the Savior of the world. What about the promise that says, this one's harder. I've laid up for you treasures in heaven. You know, in this mission, it will get hard. There will be difficulty. There will be pain. For many Maybe not in this room, maybe. There, there may be physical suffering. There may be death and martyrdom. You realize in our day today, there are more people that are losing their lives for holding to the truths of the gospel of Jesus Christ than ever before in human history, all over the world. We don't get to see that in our context, in our country. But there are people who are seeking to love their enemies as themselves proclaim the gospel at the threat of death and, and, and the loss of life, and they're choosing to do it anyway because the gospel and the love of God compels them. But they hold tight to the promise that in this life, as we walk the way of Christ, as we engage in the battle that is raging for the souls of people who do not know Jesus, we hold to the promise that God has laid up for us treasures in eternity. So we're clinging to the promises of God. But we're also actively and daily, actively and daily, putting on the full armor of God. Ephesians chapter 6, beginning in verse 10 says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be with, able to withstand the schemes of the devil. He does not mince words there, does he? For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against cosmic powers over this, uh, this present darkness, against spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the e evil day and ha having done all to stand firm. Do, do you get the sense that those who are sitting on the side will not stand? Stand therefore having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as the shoes for your feet having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. And in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. Write this down as truth number two. When the enemy prowls, remain rooted in prayer together. So reject the lies. Put on the full armor of God in the work of, prote in pr of protecting against the lies of the enemy. Like, take on like both defensive and offensive postures. As we war against the lies that the enemy is sowing in us. But then two, when the enemy prowls, remain rooted in prayer. Several of my points are a little shorter, but this one's not. That should come as no surprise. It's a major theme in this book. In verse, verses four, in verse four, we see Nehemiah um, lead the people to pray together in response to the jeers and mocking of Sambal and Tobiah. Now remember, back in chapter one, Nehemiah prayed, and it was all singular. He was praying. He himself was praying to God. Not in this particular text, though. These people have come in to the mission of God with Nehemiah. This verse 4 is full of plural language. It says, hear, O our God. It could have just said, hear, O God. But he says, hear, O our God, for we are despised. You see the plural in the text? Then in verses 7 through 9, 
we see the crowd of supporters surrounding Sambal and Tobiah growing. So before it was just he and Tobiah and one army. And now, now it includes, verses 7 through 9, the Arabs, the Ammonite, and the Ashdodites. Like all kinds of people are coming together against the people of God. You'd think, they prayed, it ought to be all better now. No, 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 no. That's not actually how it works. They prayed and it got, and it got amped up. But they were prepared. They, God did a work in them to help them work through the opposition. Not so the opposition would just disappear. So we see this plural reality. And they're plotting together, these nations, these people, to sow, specifically the text says, seeds of confusion. And what does Nehemiah do? Again, in verse 9, he leads the people again to pray together. The text says, and we prayed to our God. Do you see it? So two different times, two different prayers. In short order, Nehemiah and the people are pausing. Nehemiah and the people are going before the Lord. Nehemiah and the people are crying out to the Lord. Notice what verse, verse 6 said. I, I think the work God was seeking to do in the people when they gathered to pray together worked. It worked. This is a miracle. Because all these weak people who are building the wall should have, when these folks started showing up, the other armies, they should have packed it up and ran. But what happens in the context of them gathering together and being dependent upon the Lord and crying out to God together? Verse 6 says, so we built the wall. We built it. And all the wall was joined together to half its height. We're only halfway done, but man, all the broken spots are starting to connect up. You're starting to feel the progress. Everything's down. Different groups are building. Some of them are building faster than others. And there's the little gaps in the wall, and the gaps are starting to come together. And at this point, all the gaps start to touch. And people are still able to see over the wall, but the wall is, is coming up. The wall is coming up. So we built the wall, and the wall was joined together to half its height. For the people had a mind to work. You would think the people would have a mind to run. But in this moment, because they've been seeking the Lord, and they've been pursuing the Lord together, and they've been praying to the Lord, and they've been depending upon the Lord, their mindset is not tuck tail. Their mindset is keep going. One of the most unbelievable impacts of prayer is the way that God fuels his mission through the prayers of his people. Two years ago, we started talking. I started talking more and more about prayer. I know that prayer has been something the church has valued throughout its life for 25 years, but we began to emphasize it. And some, something we kept, we've kept saying again and again is we're not moving and we're not making decisions. We're not making moves unless we have prayed. I've said several times to Jeff and to others, this prayer time on Wednesday, this prayer time on Sunday, this, these moments where we gather for prayer and praise night, these special call prayer meetings, this is the engine. This is the place from which the move of God happens in and through Anchor Church. If you're not a part of that and you have the ability to be a part of that, become a part of that. It's the center of everything that God is doing at Anchor Church. It's the place from which we maintain a mind to work, to keep going in spite of the difficulty, to keep going in spite of the, of the struggle. We maintain a mind to work. But you realize, like, the opposition didn't cease? even when they maintained a mind to work and God accomplished what he wanted to accomplish through their prayers together. The opposition didn't stop. It actually got more intense and more complex. Verses 10 through 13 say, in Judah, now this is definitively within, the, um, within and among the people of God, likely the people who are working on the wall themselves. In Judah, it was said, the strength of those who bear the burdens is failing there's too much rubble. By ourselves, we're not going to be able to build the wall. These folks weren't coming to prayer meeting. Right? They weren't coming to prayer meeting. It's going to fall apart. They weren't coming to prayer meetings. 
The fuel that God intended to pour on their hearts to give them a mind that said, I will keep working. They were struggling. They were coming to prayer meeting. In Judah, it was said, the strength of those who build the burdens, uh, who are, uh, who, the strength of those who um, bear the burdens is failing. There's too much rubble. By ourselves, we will not be able to re- rebuild the wall. So that's, that's one message. And then it says, and our enemies said, they, are, um, they will not um, know or see till we come in among them and kill them to stop the work. So we've got the people of God who are becoming discouraged. We've got the enemies of God who are like, ha, 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 ha. We're going to sneak in there. We're going to stick a few of these folks. And at that time, the text says, the Jews who lived near them, the ones who were not in the building building the wall, but the ones who lived around them, came to them from all directions. They hear that the people are about to just be pummeled and destroyed. And they said to us 10 different times. Have you ever gotten a phone call after phone call after phone call after phone call from somebody? That usually means they really want you, right? I had a few of those this weekend from um, my kids, you know, trying to get in touch with me at different, different points. And so, you know, you... You have these people that are from all around that are like coming to them and saying, you need to return to us. They're about to run you down. So in the lowest parts of the space behind the wall, in the open places, Nehemiah says, I station the people by their clans with their, this is the first offensive and defensive reality in the text, with their swords and their spears and their bows. So, so far, the work's a bunch of people that gathered together with trowels and shovels. Well, now... Nehemiah's like, all right, guys. The intensity's rising. Get your sword. I did a little traveling this weekend. My intent was to bring, I have a knife. And um, it's about this long. It was my grandfather's in World War II, and it looks really old and cool, and it kind of looks a little bit like some of the short swords that they would use in Old Testament. And my hope was to open it up and be like, look, this, they're ready. They're ready to work, but I failed at that. I came, from out of t- I came from out of town straight to church this morning. Um, so do you just imagine that in your own mind this morning? So Nehemiah says, get your sword, get your spear, get your bows. So you see what's going on here? Nehemiah and the people are working and receiving messages from a lot of different places. Some workers are saying, I think, I think, Nehemiah, we might be too weak. Like this work might be too much for us. I'm not sure we can do this by ourselves. It sounds a lot like what they were told at the very beginning of the chapter, right? These lies have begun to seep in their hearts. I think largely because they're focused on the enemy rather than on the Lord and on the work that God has given them to do. And the enemies of God are saying, let's sneak in among them and let's kill some of them. And the Jews who live nearby, the folks who are um, close but not building, maybe some of these um, nobles that decided they, they weren't going to like humble themselves to stoop and serve the Lord. They're like, abandon your work, you're going to die. All these messages sound a lot like Sambal and Tobiah, sound a lot like the enemy from verses 1 and 2. So did the work stop? So we're in waves here, right? They're working, the enemies come. They're praying, they keep working, they have a good mindset. The enemies like get more intense. So, so now it's like time to give up, right? No, no. No way. Verse 13 says, Nehemiah stationed people with swords and spears and bows in the vulnerable places. For what? To, de- de- to defend from il- infiltration and attack, and I think to encourage those who were tempted to believe the lies of the enemy. In our context, when confusion and chaos seeps in, we must pray and we must defend the mission and we must do what we can to keep the weaker brothers and sisters dependent and confident on the, in the Lord. We must do everything we, we can do to help them fix their eyes on the greatness of our king instead of the greatness of our enemy. What did Nehemiah and the people pray that led to this sort of like determination and unwavering resolve that led them to even like step in with those who were becoming discouraged, um, that provided wisdom for them to navigate this trouble. They prayed like in three primary directions. 
in the text. In verse 4, they cried out to God for help. In verse 4, they cried out to God for help. Hear, O our God, for we are despised. We are despised. There are times when we find ourselves in difficulty, when we've taken our eyes off of King Jesus, when we're not actively engaging in the together prayer life of the body of Christ. There are times when we stop seeing clearly the reality that God is far greater than our enemy. And there's times like that, that all we can do is say, God, help, because we feel feeble. And our situation seems feeble because we're not seeing clearly. Friends, like, there's no guilt necessarily in that, but there is a need to return to the Lord in prayer and to catch a fresh vision of who God is. There's a need to cry out for help, and when God shows himself to you, your fear, your fear will fade. Then in verses 4 and 5, they pray against the enemy. So they cry out to God for help, and they pray against the enemy. Verses 4 and 5 say, Turn back their taunts, about halfway through verse 4, on their own heads and give them up to be plundered in the land where they are captives. Do not cover their guilt and let not their sin be blotted out from your sight, for they have provoked you to anger in the presence of of the builders. So that there's an active effort to pray against the enemy. Against the enemy. Remember, our enemy, there's all kinds of folks who are walking in opposition to the Lord right now. Our job is to love them and to declare the gospel to them and to pray for them. Ultimately, our enemy, the application here is, there's a very real spiritual enemy, Satan, that God has defeated already. Christ died and rose from the dead, and he's defeated. But there are times when we get discouraged, when the, he is attacking us. The war is won. In the end, it's over and done. But there are times when he's attacking us, and we lose sight of who God is and his strength and power. Scripture gives us all the room in the world to hate the enemy, to hate the sin that's creating all of this confusion and doubt and struggle to pray that God will do what he's already said he's going to do God crush this enemy remove this enemy wound this enemy clear the way for your people God help I think that this is something we don't do a lot in our church tradition we like to cry out to God for help but to pray that God would crush his enemy entirely appropriate and right. God, crush your enemy. God, make the way straight for your people. We're not talking about turning to the enemy to address him. <laughs> like, God does that work. Nehemiah never, like, stops to, like, go out to the hillside and, like, have a little time with the army and have a discussion. No, no, he just cries out to God that God would deal with the enemy. That's the right move. So, cries out to God for help. Praise that God will crush the enemy. And I believe, although it's implied in verse 9, they prayed for wisdom to navigate the difficulty and power to endure. I think we see that because they navigate with wisdom and they have the power to endure. It just says that Nehemiah prayed there in verse 9. See, look, it says, And we prayed to our God and set guard as protection against them day and night. There was wisdom given through their prayer. And then it gets real hot. All kinds of difficulty comes to their doorstep, and it seems like Nehemiah is just navigating it. Do you see that? Like smooth sailing through this conflict, no problem. Why? Because Nehemiah has given himself to the work of prayer. He's called upon the Lord to give him wisdom and help him navigate difficulty. The book of James, James encourages us, when you need wisdom, pray, ask God. Because God is a God who gives wisdom to his people when we ask for it. So when we're navigating conflict and difficulty and confusion in the execution of the mission, pray for wisdom because God gives it generously to all who ask. 
when we face opposition, when our confidence is failing, we cry out to God for help. We ask God to hear and see and act on our behalf. When the enemy is coming hard at us, we oppose him in prayer and remember that Jesus has won the victory. When we don't know what to do, we pray for wisdom. When our strength is failing, we pray for power. The common theme is we pray. We become the house of prayer that God has called the church to be. A house of prayer for the nations. Write this down, it's truth number three. This one will be a little shorter. When the enemy prowls, promote clarity and focus. In verses two and three, we see that the initial attack of the enemy was to mock and demoralize the people. But then in verse eight, the enemy's strategy becomes a little bit more cunning and focused. We learn that the enemy has determined to what? So confusion ahead of a physical attack. Remember, he's like, let's go stick some people. At the head of a, of, a confu- of, a, uh, of a physical attack, there's an effort to sow confusion. I don't, I don't know if you've read any books on war, but basically every book ever written on war recognizes the central importance of demoralizing the enemy and sowing confusion on the battlefield. Discouragement and confusion paved the way for successful campaign. Everybody that's ever been in a war knows this is the fact. Satan does too. He sows seeds of doubt and works to cause confusion among the people of God because what is nearly as good as an apathetic church in a robe and fuzzy slippers is a confused and conflicted church. He doesn't care which. He'll take apathetic or he'll take confused and conflicted. Either way, there's no mission that's being unfolded. From verses 10 to 12, we see confusion and conflict that can be, uh, that can be stirred by demoralized, within demoralized workers, by, by the enemy himself and by the people of God who have chosen to sit on the sidelines of the work. We've already said that prayer is a central means to address the lies of confusion. But one thing that was clear to Nehemiah and most of the people, God had called them to build and He was with them. That was clear. No matter what was going on around them, no matter what lies were being sown, no matter what confusion was uh, um, campaign was being unfolded, God's people knew that God had called them to build and that he was with them to empower them in the project. For us, there's a need, along with consistent prayer together, to clarify our calling and refocus our lives on it over and over, and over, and over, because the enemy's doing everything he can do to get us distracted, demoralized, and confused. In a particular church, in a particular place, even, there's a need to regularly clarify the mission, vision, and values of the church. The purpose for which we exist And there's a need to call the body of Christ to wholeheartedly embrace the call of God. You know, sometimes it can be a little bit exhausting to hear the mission and the vision and the values and the call again and again and again and again. Some might even say, can we preach on something else? Well, sure. Well, sure. There's a whole lot that God wants to unfold here. But you can't ever step away from the mission. God's mission is in every book and every chapter in the entire Bible. It's there. We will never escape from declaring the mission that God has given us. We will never stop pursuing it because it's central to the purpose of the church. If there's no mission, why are we here? If you're reading the Bible and you cannot see mission all over Scripture, you're not looking. You're not looking. It's everywhere. There's a need for us to continue again and again and again and again to clarify the mission, to call people to to join in the mission, and to guard against the enemy who seeks to bring a lack of clarity and to promote a lack of focus on the mission.
So when the enemy prowls, we promote clarity and focus on the things that God has saved us and called us to do. Write this down as truth number four. When the enemy prowls, encourage each other. When the enemy prowls, encourage one another. In verse 14, Nehemiah speaks to the workers who were discouraged, demoralized, and a bit confused. He says, I love this. Do not be afraid of them. Now, remember, it's gotten hotter and hotter and hotter, more and more intense, more and more enemies, more and more prayer. And there comes a point where it's like, oh! And Nehemiah says, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Remember the Lord. It's the best part. Don't be afraid. Remember God. You've taken your eyes off the one who is great and glorious and powerful and creator, and you're worried a bit now. You're confused a bit now. You're distracted a bit now. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. And now they got a sword <laughs> and they got their boots on. They're ready. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your brothers and your sons and your daughters and your wives and your homes. I love this. Nehemiah gets up after praying and stationing guards to address the, the hearts and the needs of the people. And he says, Let, now let's, let's address the realities of what's going on here that caused all this confusion for just a second. You know, we, we're going to set some folks around that have got their swords out. They're ready to go. But let's address the heart issue. Don't be afraid. Remember the Lord. Our God is great. He is awesome. In other words, the God who is with us and is for us is the source of our confidence. Remember who he is, what he said, how he moved in the past, what he's promised. Remember the Lord. Great and awesome. When things become difficult and you see others struggling or demoralized and confused, church, let's do what Nehemiah did. Let's just say you're all amped up because you're all prayed up and in the word and you're all focused on the Lord, but there's some in the body who are not. And they're demoralized and they're struggling and they're confused. Let's do what Nehemiah did. Let's do everything we can do to rush to their aid, to demonstrate our care for them. He, remember, he set guard, but then we have to speak the truth to one another. It's a part of our discipling of one another. Encourage your brothers and sisters, your partners in ministry. Don't say, you can do it. They can't. Don't say that. Don't say you can do it. Because they can't do it on their own. I can do all things to Christ who strengthens me. But then we put a period on the end of that for some reason. No, you can't do all things through Christ. I mean, you could do all things like through yourself. You can only do th all things through Christ who gives you strength. Let's not say, you can do it in our encouragement. Instead say, don't be afraid. Don't run. What you see is big now. Turn and look who's on your shoulder. He is way scarier than that. Don't be afraid. We can't do this, but don't be afraid. Remember the Lord. He's great and awesome. He will fight for us. Only God's Holy Spirit-filled church can accomplish a mission as big as making disciples of all nations, and only God can do it. Only God can do it. So point one another to the greatness of God. Encourage one another to see God for who He is and to embrace Him and to trust Him. But then also, call your brothers and sisters to arms. After pointing people to the Lord, Nehemiah says, and fight. 
Fight for your brothers and your sons and your daughters and your wives and your homes. Can I tell you some of my very favorite parts of our prayer gatherings are when someone says, my son needs Jesus. My daughter needs Jesus. My neighbor needs Jesus. My coworker needs Jesus. My family member needs Jesus. The kids over there at Grayson High School and at this school and that school, they need Jesus. Can we please pray that God would save people? He'd use us to see people know Jesus. What does it look like to take up arms for your brothers and your sons and your daughters and your wives and your homes in our context? First and foremost, it begins with prayer. This is where the battle springs from, is desperate and dependent prayer before the Lord. It's in prayer that we fight this battle. And then as the Spirit leads and as the Spirit fills and as the Spirit opens our mouths, then the battle is, includes also being Spirit-led to speak the goodness of who Christ is in the gospel of Jesus. That's what it looks like to fight for your brothers and your sons and your daughters and your wives and your homes. Church family, I know you, I know, you know this already. This text is a war cry. When Christ was born in that manger, God declared war on the enemy. When the Spirit fell in the upper room, God declared war on the enemy. When Christ rose from the dead, victory was guaranteed. But here and now, we're instruments of the Lord, taking the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ in our community. He's drafted us and declared war on the enemy. Our war cry is, do not fear. Remember the Lord, great and awesome. Fight for the salvation of your neighbors, your coworkers, your classmates, your family members and friends, and the millions of others who will suffer in a very real and eternal hell without the good news of Jesus among all nations. Our encouragement that we're giving to one another looks a couple of different ways. It's to call the people of God around us to look to God for strength, power, and confidence and to remember the great need for Jesus all around us. All around us. And to allow through prayer and through our time in the Word together, God to prepare us to be filled with the Spirit so that we might declare the good news of Christ in the world. Write this down. Last truth, truth number five. I'm running a little long, but oh my goodness. When the enemy prowls, maintain, don't ever set it aside, maintain a warring posture. There will be a day the war will end. Christ will return. All sin and death will be no more. It will be all grace, peace, joy, and love forever and ever and ever. But until then, maintain a warring posture. In the final third of Nehemiah 4, um, in that final third of Nehemiah 4, the tone shifts. We see the enemy back down a bit, and the work resumes, but it, they don't go back to the way it was before, where everybody's like, happy and building on the wall. No, there's a realization in this text that, that enemy is always there on the hillside. And things change for the people of God. A new posture is adopted. Verses 16 through 23 unfold this. From that day on, half the servants worked on the construction and half held spears and shields and bows and coats of mail. And the leader stood behind the whole house of Judah who were building on the wall. Those who carried the burdens were loaded in such a way that, that each labored on the work with one hand and held a weapon with the other. 
and each of the builders had his sword strapped to his side while he built. The man who, who sounded the trumpet was beside me, and I said to the nobles and to the officials and to the rest of the people, the work is great and widely spread, and we are separated on this wall far from one another. In the place where you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally to us there. Our God will fight for us. So we labored at the work, and half of them held spears from um, the break of dawn until the stars came out. I also said to the people at that time, Let every man and his servant pass the night inside the walls of Jerusalem, that they may be, on, may be a guard for us by night that, and labor by the day. So neither I nor my brothers nor my servants nor the men of the guard who followed me, none of us took off our clothes. Each of us kept his weapon at his side, at his right hand. They didn't even take their clothes off to sleep. It's a new posture for them. It's a new day for them. In the Western church, this shift must take place in every church that wants to live and accomplish the Great Commission. It must. We must trade in the robe and fuzzy slippers and the comfy couch of our me-centered worship for the armor of God, for the armor of God. We must learn to walk in the Holy Spirit's power. For far too long, much of the church has set aside the third person of the Trinity and has not walked in the power of the Spirit of God day to day. We have no sense of what it looks like to pick up the sword of the word of God every single day. I don't know if I want to be in a small group that asks me to do personal devotions. Well, you're going to be dead on the field. I think that's what the word teaches. I don't want to be in community or come to prayer meeting. You're going to be dead on the field. I'm not saying it's required to come to prayer meeting every week, but to value prayer as a central activity of your life Amen. is required. Amen. It's what Christians do. Cultural Christianity is not Christianity. American Western Christianity is not Christianity. It is something totally different wrapped in Jesus. If you work through this particular section, recognize how this reorientation looked in Nehemiah's context. They reorganized in order to be ready for battle. Hmm. So they took all the norms, changed some, threw some out, and adopted some new ones. That's hard for a church, isn't it? But these folks, they reorganized for battle so that everyone can be in it. In their context, some were designated exclusively to watch, protect, and war. I'm so thankful for our, our people who come here week after week for a prayer meeting. Some of us can't every week. There's all kinds of other things going on. We're praying at home, praying in different ways, but I'm so thankful for the men and women who gather here on Wednesdays and Sunday mornings when there's no class, and at other times, like, when there's a special called meeting, something's going on in the church, and everybody's sort of like the trumpet going, beep, 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 let's run. So Jeff will send out an email and say, we've got to pray tonight, there's a thing. And people show up. The week that JT had a stroke, like 40 people, the night we found out, showed up here and began to cry out for this man's life. You know, you don't have to have a stroke to call a meeting like that. I'm grateful we did. But you can say, my neighbor really needs Jesus. I want to call the meeting. JT knows Jesus. The neighbor doesn't. Right? Yeah. Super pumped about that. <laughs> I mean, I know that. I'm just being silly, I guess. So they reorganized to be ready for battle. Some were designated exclusively to watch and protect into war. Everyone had a weapon. You don't see anybody that doesn't have a weapon in the text. Oh, so-and-so, they're a conscientious objector. They have no weapon. No, no, no. That's not how this works. 
There were no conscientious objectors to the weapons in this space. There's no conscientious objectors to prayer, to the battle of God that God has called us into. Everybody had a weapon. Some of them had a little short weapon. Some of them had a big, long weapon. Some had a spear, but they all had weapons. In our context, God's called us all to enter the war, to be people of prayer, a house of prayer. Workers had one hand on the trowel and one hand on the sword. You know, this and this are two very different postures. Right? Very different postures. One hand on the wall and one hand on the sword. Up, down, up, down. Come at me. You know? That's their posture. One hand on the trowel, one hand on the sword. In Nehemiah's context, they never let their guard down. The text says at the end, day and night and day and night. There were people that stayed up all night to watch. They didn't even take off their clothes. They never let their guard down. They had an emergency plan. I already touched on this. I won't dig too deep into it, but a big part of our emergency plan needs to be, it's time to pray. And the body shows up to pray because we believe that much in our great God. We need to have some trumpet blowers. Honestly, every discipleship group ought to have a prayer trumpet blower in some way. Somebody who's saying, here's our request, but not just that. Somebody that says, yeah, I got a text. Can we pray about this? Call up somebody in your group. Pray together about it. You know? Turn your group life into a prayer battleground for the world around us, for each other. That text thread, you know it's not only about communication. That thread, you know, some of you are like, I get 25 texts a day for my group. Some of you, it's a little less. Um, Don't be annoyed by that. Turn it into prayer. You you know you can even text prayer. David wrote down a whole bunch of prayers. God, I pray that you would um, help so-and-so in their struggle to share the gospel. God, empower them, fill them with the Spirit. Bam! Send it off. Bing! Now there's like 15 people in your group that are like, yes, 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 I'm praying that too. They had an emergency plan. And they looked out for one another and they guarded one another. They had each other's backs in this process, reminding each other of the Lord, praying for each other, lifting each other up. Application for us, it's time to recommit ourselves to the mission to rise up and build, to wholeheartedly join in the work of making disciples of all nations. It's time we learn to put on the full armor of God and maintain a warring posture. It's time for us to become a house of prayer for the nations. Any amens? Amens. Moving forward, we must be resolved to never let our guard down, to love one another by praying for one another, protecting one another, redirecting one another, to look to trust in God, to encourage one another. This is the work of the Lord. It's the way of the Lord. This is the church. Greg and I were talking after the sermon last week, and I have no idea how to go about this, but we were talking about, like, how in the world do you call people to, like, indicate that they're, they're ready to charge the hill? And I said, I have no idea. But, you know, like, a lot of times we just end a sermon, we end a service, and we hope that the Lord is stirred. And we pray that God's moved. But a lot of times, we're left to just kind of wonder. Are we done with fuzzy slippers and comfy robes? That's, that's the question. Are we willing to embrace a different posture? Is our view of God determining the steps? 
our vision of him, or is our fear determining our steps? I think there's all kinds of people in this room in different places related to this particular teaching time. There's some of you who've been here for a long time, maybe visiting with us for a, a six months or whatever. I'm super glad you're here, but I think there's some of you that are here that you, you really don't even know if you know Jesus. The version of Christianity that you probably came into this building with looked a little bit different than what we talked about today. Maybe a lot different than what we talked about today. But you know because we're working through God's word week in and week out that it's true. You know because you've looked at Christianity from the outside and thought, Ugh. because it felt inauthentic, shallow. There's nothing about Christianity that's inauthentic and shallow. There's nothing about Jesus that's inauthentic and shallow. Nothing. If you're in a room and you don't know that you know Jesus, hopefully today you hear Jesus say, follow me, and you hear it a little different. Hey, friend, follow me. I'm great. I'm awesome. I've got a mission. I'm going to give you a purpose. Follow me. If you're in the room today and you don't know for certain, even if you've been here a long time and you got baptized as a six-year-old, if you're not certain that you're in Christ Jesus, today's your day. You should embrace Christ by faith. In your own heart, turn to Christ and say, God, I'm, I'm in. Surrender my life and faith to Jesus. Here I am. Lead me. We don't have to close our eyes. I think all that's kind of manipulative sometimes. We do it on occasion, but I don't always know how to handle this. But is there anybody in here you just say, yeah, I need to give my life to Jesus today? Anybody? I, I need to turn my life over to Jesus today. Don't be afraid. We serve a great God. He's good. We're going to be pumped for you. Anyone? Now hear me. If the Holy Spirit right now is scratching on your back and you're like, I don't want to raise my hand, that's fine. Come find somebody, though. We want to help you. I mean, recognize all kinds of folks that are even in Christ get, get scared sometimes. We want to give you room to say, I want Jesus, but this scares me to death. You know, so we pray, we're praying for you. We know that there's people that God's brought into this place, that God been fighting the Spirit of God as they, the Spirit has called you to embrace Christ by faith genuinely. We know there's people here like that. We know there's people online that are in here most weeks. Right. Now here's the question. Who will rise up and build? That's the next question because... In the Bible, there's no separation between repentance and rise up. There's no separation. There's times of preparation, a process of preparation, but there's no separation. If you're saved and God's filled you with the Spirit, you can go out to the public's grocery store today and the Holy Spirit can hit and you can share the gospel of Jesus. There's no separation. When you get baptized, there's a new self coming out of that water and he's on mission or she's on mission. So... Who will rise up and build? Do I have to tell you how to respond? I don't know. I don't know. Who? Karen and Sean, I knew they'd say yes. Who's in? I'll rise up and build. I'll rise up and build. I'm in for this. I'll rise up and build. Now look, whether you stand up or not, I want to give everybody a ton of grace here, but God wants to pour out his power and spirit in this church. He wants to. He wants to use you to do things beyond your wildest dreams. He wants to. Pray for each other that God would pour out his spirit and empower his church to do great things in our community and beyond our community and among the nations. Pray. And then give yourself to the work. Can I pray over the body? Father, thank you for this church. Everyone's sitting, everyone's standing, all around the room. Like there's all kinds of 
I think, things that you're doing in our hearts in this time. But Lord, I, I just pray that you would pour out your spirit in this church and that you'd do things that are beyond our imagination. God, I pray that we wouldn't fear the enemy. The whole army that's on the hillside over there, I pray that you, you would empower our minds and our hearts not to fear, but that, God, we would step in and step forward in the mission of God. Lord, we pray you prepare the harvest field. There's men and women and boys and girls in our community and among the nations who are in desperate need of eternal life. Lord, do in and through us anything and everything that's necessary to lead us to be the hands and feet and voice of Jesus, builders in this time and in this place. We love you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Would everybody stand up? We're going to sing. Uh, church, thank you for being a body who really wants to do everything and be everything that God wants you to be. God's going to do great things here. He's going to do great things here. We love every single one of you and are glad you're here. I'm glad you're a part of this work. Storms of hell pursue
I don't mean that if you're not in a small group or you're not in a prayer, coming to prayer on Wednesday night, that somehow you're on the sidelines. You know, God has different things for different people at different times and seasons. It doesn't mean that we don't see you as included or a major part of the church. So I think sometimes when we call for something like that, and it feels like a real definitive line, it doesn't leave a lot of room for folks to kind of wrestle through what God is doing and what his plans are. And I want you to know that's not what this was. This was just generally like, are we desiring as a church to be a part of the way of Christ together. That's what this is about. It's not a line in the sand on small groups or on prayer meeting or any of the rest of that. God's going to do what God's going to do with individual families as we go along. Mm -hmm. um, and he's going to move you. This is not an us and them or in or out kind of moment. This is just us saying together as a faith family, God, wherever you lead, we will go. Mm -hmm. And we will not be afraid. Yes. So I just want to make sure that was clear. Because I think there's room to sow division in what we just did that wasn't planned. It just mm -hmm. kind of arose out of my heart and uh, several responses around the room. But there is room for division if we're not careful in the way we go about things like that. And every one of you is loved here. Yes. And so, and look, if there's anything that we, that I long for in the work of the guarding the unity of the body is constructive thought and feedback. And so I want to encourage you to continue to do that too. You know, notice that Nehemiah's plan has changed. You know, like, and I'm not Nehemiah. You know, like the elders were doing our best to lead by the Spirit, but just know that every one of you, we're glad you're here. We're glad you're in. We're thankful for the Amen. constructive feedback, for the thoughts. You know, and we definitely don't want to push through for anything other than unity <coughs> and the mission and the mission of God. Amen. Hey, I think we're done Amen. for the day, right? Amen. Yeah. JT, we done? Yep, we're done. All right, we're done. Grace and peace, y'all. Have a great day. <laughs>